Hi, everyone. It's, it's really great to be here. I appreciate the Mises Institute inviting me here to, to give this short talk, and especially to my sponsors, uh, Scott and Kathy Ullery, whose um, donations have allowed this to, to happen and, and allow me to talk about one of my favorite things. I, I love teaching my American economic history class at Wofford. I've taught that for 23 years now, I think. And one of my favorite pieces of American history to talk about is the war between the states. Um, there's a lot of students I find increasingly are coming in with less and less kind of background knowledge of American history, especially the economic side of it. And I find that, um, in, in fact, there's a lot of, of myths about American history that I have to then um, take care of. Uh, my favorite, of course, would be the New Deal. They all think that the, you know, Roosevelt saved the country uh, with, uh, with massive government borrowing and spending and whatever Roosevelt didn't take care of, World War II took care of. And so that I, I get to that in a couple of weeks in my class. I'm going to have fun with that. But I really do enjoy um, uh, teaching about the economic history of the war between the states. And uh, you're all now in the South, right? Welcome to Dixie. Uh, this is the original Dixie. Uh, this is um, a banknote, a $10 banknote issued in the 1860s. In fact, I think this may, may have been an unissued note because it does not have the specific date. It's got 186 and somebody was supposed to fill in the year. But it's, uh, it's issued by, or was to be issued by the Citizens Bank of um, Louisiana, which was a prominent bank in the New Orleans area. And of course, the French language was widely used in that area. And the French word for 10 is 10, which of course we corrupt that to Dix. And so that note became a Dixie. And the area over which this note circulated, a very large area, uh, began to be known eventually as Dixieland. So it was um, a banknote that gave this region its, uh, its nickname. Um, the banking system prior to the war between the states is commonly known as the free banking era. Um, during this time, regulation on banking was relatively light, uh, not, of course, non-existent. And until 1863, state banking commissions chartered all public banks in the United States. There was no national paper money. Uh, individual chartered banks issued banknotes that would generally circulate in a small regional area. Uh, in order to obtain a state charter, the, state, uh, the, the bank's owners had to show that they had sufficient specie and reserve, gold and silver, in reserve to back the notes that they wanted to issue. This did not have to be 100%, unfortunately, and was generally far less. Sometimes a run on a bank would occur if people began to doubt that the bank had enough in, in reserves to pay out depositors in a timely manner, and uh, banks would sometimes suspend specie payments. This meant that sometimes in a panic, uh, people would try to get specie out of other banks, and then that panic or crisis could spread. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Panic of 1837, which was an example of that kind of thing. If the bank failed, then the notes became worthless, and the state government could revoke the bank's charter. But this regulation uh, was not really effective. Um, some states even allowed uh, flogging of the bank's directors, which might have been a little more effective. Uh, so bank owners, at least to save their hide, literally, uh, would want to avoid overissue of banknotes and want to make sure that they had enough in specie uh, to back up those notes. It wasn't just banks, by the way, that were issuing these notes. Sometimes it would be uh, large firms. Um, we saw, uh, for example, this is a, a, a railroad bank note uh, issued by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which is well known to players of Monopoly as the B&O. And uh, it's 12 and a half cents, which was, used to be worth something. Um, <laughs> many people did complain about so-called wildcat banks that issued more bank notes than their gold or silver reserves warranted. 
But some of these bank currencies and these large corporations that issued notes uh, would be quite successful and, and gain a wide circulation as, as the Dixie did, which I mentioned earlier. There were hundreds or even thousands of different um, currencies in circulation in the United States at this time. Of course, in any one area, you might only have a, a few, but over the entire country, you had, had uh, many. Uh, bearer bonds would circulate as well, and um, so this is one of those uh, um, uh, railroad notes. Here's another one from South Carolina from 1862, the Southwestern Railroad uh, Bank. Uh, branching of uh, chartered banks was limited, uh, particularly in the north. Branch banking was present in the south, and tended to strengthen the banking system there, so that, that relatively light regulation was even lighter, where you could have multiple branches of a, of a bank, and that tended to strengthen the system, especially during a crisis. So in the Panic of 1857, for example, there were uh, uh, virtually no bank failures or suspensions of payment of specie in the South, whereas the North did have some of those because the North did not have or did not allow for branch banking. So you'd have literally one location for um, many banks, and there would not even be a bank in a neighboring county. So that left banks vulnerable. That regulation that limited branch banking left banks vulnerable to a local economic crisis. So if you have a local drought or you have a major employer that shuts down, uh, then that, that can lead to a, a local um, bank failure. Um, in his article on frontier bank robberies, which is a very entertaining article and enlightening, uh, Larry Schweikart says that overall the combination of state charters and free banks led to one of the most stable and prosperous periods known in American financial history. Contrary to the predictions of some, when money was taken out of the hands of the government and subjected to a private market, it produced a stable free market money supply. Well, of course, war tends to bring about a lot of uh, turmoil, not only uh, the military destruction and so forth, but also financially. It also brings about a degradation of the monetary system very often. And when the war between the states came along in 1861, both the North and the South had significant monetary crises. Of course, most of the money from, for the war was raised, uh, at least in the North, from uh, borrowing. About 70% was uh, bond issues. One innovation there was to uh, raise money by selling bonds to individuals and small denominations. The ancestors of the uh, war bonds of later and then the uh, savings bonds that we still have around today. The first income tax in the United States was levied during that war, the North needed more money than it could reasonably borrow, and so the Revenue Act of August 5, 1861 included an income tax with incomes over $600 being taxed at a rate of 3%. That was opposed by many people in the North, including this gentleman here, Clement Valentine, who uh, was um, vociferous in his opposition to the Lincoln administration. He was, complained about the income tax. He said it was wicked and cruel. Uh, and so uh, the Lincoln administration didn't take very kindly to that, and they arrested him and charged him before a military court in Ohio. Uh, not a war zone. There were uh, civilian courts open, but of course uh, that, that mattered not. So um, it was decided that he would then be forcibly exiled to the South he was not from the South, did not want to go there, so he managed to escape to Canada. Uh, the Union went deeply into debt to pay for the war, and when the demand for bonds dropped off as the popularity of the war began to diminish, especially in 1863, there were draft riots, there was anti-war sentiment that was growing in the North, and so the government needed to drum up some demand for their bonds, and so they implemented another part of uh, Henry Clay's American system. Uh, Clay had died a few years before, but his ideas were being carried uh, forward with uh, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, so centralized banking was another part of Clay's uh, 
grand scheme for the economy of the United States. So we got the National Banking and Currency Acts of 1863 and 64, which created nationally chartered banks, which would then create this demand for, um, for uh, uh, government bonds. Uh, these banks would issue greenbacks, which would be provided by the government, of course, in great quantity. And uh, as a backing, these banks would hold not gold or silver, but U.S. Treasury bonds. And of course, that, that gives the government a, a, a major uh, customer for these bonds that they were increasingly having trouble selling to ordinary citizens. At the same time, the state banks would be crippled by a high 10% tax on the face value of their bank notes. And so that would begin in 1866, but the state banks could see the writing on the wall. Um, so in order to survive, those state banks began accepting greenbacks as uh, deposits. Uh, state banks declined a number from almost 1,500 that were in existence in 1863 to only 349 by 1865. But by 1865, there were over 1,600 nationally chartered banks. This is why we have a dual charter system where some banks today are chartered by states and others are chartered by the federal government. Uh, this is a greenback. This is a $1 uh, uh, greenback. You can see the green ink on the, on the obverse side of the, of the note. Uh, greenbacks were um, resisted by, the, by a couple of states, especially California and Oregon. I'll mention that again in a minute. Um, but this was the result of a legal tender act in 1862, which provided for $150 million worth of these greenbacks, 50, of mil, uh, 50 million of which replaced old treasury notes. Another uh, Greenback Act followed very closely um, again in 1862, allowed for another $150 million in these notes, 35 million of which would be in small denominations. Again, trying to go after the small, uh, the, 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 the uh, lower classes, lower middle classes, to try to get them to accept these, these notes. So, um, uh, Greenbacks, as I said, were, were uh, resisted by a couple of states. They said this is not compatible with our state constitutions. They refused to accept them in payment of taxes. Um, and they did suffer a decline in value over the course of the, of the war. Um, the low point came in July of 1864 when it took $2.64 in greenbacks to buy $1 worth of gold. Uh, the money creation was uh, constantly mocked in the, uh, in the, in the press. Uh, Lincoln here, I mean, there's all kinds of, we could spend 30 minutes just examining the, the humor in this, but uh, Lincoln is depicted in this particular, he's in the center upper part of that. He, he's, uh, he's depicted here as being somewhat out of touch. He's saying something like, all this reminds me of a most capital joke. Uh, <laughs> And well, uh, that's nice, but you can see the printing press uh, kind of churning away over there on the, on the left. Um, greenbacks continued to be used after the war. This is one from 1880. Uh, generally, they did rise in value, and they even became redeemable in gold by 1879. Uh, this is one from 1928, uh, $1 uh, US note. That was the, that was the official uh, name of those, of those greenbacks. This is a 1968 note, a $100 United States note. Um, and these, these, of course, were not in common circulation. By that point, we were using, of course, Federal Reserve notes. Um, so turning to the Confederacy, the Confederacy, of course, faced even greater financial problems during the war than the North did. Um, the Confederacy was trying to raise money from tariffs. Uh, tariffs were the major source of federal revenue. If you had an argument about or a debate about federal finance um, prior to the war and even for many years after, it was basically a, a, a debate about tariffs. Uh, the North generally wanted higher protective tariffs. That was another part of Henry Clay's American system. 
Um, they finally got uh, the, the big tariff they were, they were wanting once the southern states seceded in 1860 and 1861, and uh, the moral tariff, um, which had a, was a 50% tariff on a lot, of, a lot of imports, finally got those northern manufacturers what they were, what they were aiming at. But the South had a fairly low tariff, but they had trouble even collecting that. Um, the Union began blockading southern ports. That blockade became increasingly effective as the war went on. Uh, so attempts at raising money through tariffs really was difficult. And if, if it weren't for the Union blockade, the Confederate government managed to contribute to their own problems by trying to essentially nationalize a lot of the uh, traffic with Europe and began imposing confiscatory taxes on anyone bringing in cargo from, the, uh, from, from Europe. The um, uh, government did try to borrow, but they, unlike the North, did not get the majority of their money from borrowing only about 35%. Uh, a lot of the Confederate um, money raising came from money creation. Uh, the Confederate Treasury issued something like a million dollars of notes in 1861, but by 1863, that was pocket change. They had issued $700 million worth of notes and produced a rapid inflation. They did try an income tax that didn't work very well. They also tried to tax other goods. Uh, they tried to tax crops, they tried to confiscate, well, they did confiscate northern property, but all of this was still leaving the Confederate government with a great deal of financial strain. These are all 72 of the official Confederate government notes. You can see there were quite a, quite a few of these. Uh, some of these are in large denominations. Uh, this is a $50 Note, um, here's one from North Carolina in 1863 that was $50. Uh, here is one that's $500. This would probably buy you a pair of shoes, buy a cheap pair of shoes, by the end of the, of the war. This was an 1864 date on this note, which kind of tells you where things were, were headed. Uh, here's an 1864 $50 note from Alabama. And here's a $4 note. I'm not sure what the date is on this one, but this was from South Carolina. Uh, the Confederate government ran large deficits, especially early on, but their credit rating kind of suffered as the war dragged on and they began losing battles and it was hard to entice people to lend to a government that the lenders weren't quite sure was going to be in existence very much longer. And so you can see that the growth rate of the deficit did not increase much after about 1862. But you can see here that the debt service began to be a very large part of the Confederate government's budget by the end of the war, uh, occupying even more than war expenditures per se. So. This was uh, a, a, an indicator of how much financial trouble the Confederate government was in by the, by the end of the war. You can see here, uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you can see here that the non-interest bearing notes, that's the bottom line of that table, uh, peaked in 1861, late 1861, early 1862. Um, continued to be important in 1862, and in terms of real value, they began to drop off, not because they were not issuing these things, but because inflation was beginning to set in. And you can see where the, the impact of the military side of the war was becoming more and more disadvantageous for the Confederate financial situation, where the more battles were lost, the more uh, problems they began to have with inflation, they did try a currency reform in, eight, in February of 1864, which did manage to moderate some of the inflation. You can, you can see here that the inflation rate went from about 700% down to only about 53% in a matter of a couple of months due to this currency reform. Uh, but uh, that, that did not last, and of course, as it became evident that the Confederacy was going to lose the war and anyone holding Confederate dollars was going to find them worthless, uh, the inflation rate skyrocketed up to a peak of about 5,700%. Um, in fact, it became so bad that the um, 
that some Confederate troops were paid with greenbacks because the Confederate dollars were not enough to entice them to continue. Um, I'm almost out of time, but I, I will say this, this is one of those currency destruction uh, problems that we see somewhat on the Union side, much more aggravated on the Confederate side. And, and it illustrates the basic idea that governments can raise funds in one of three ways, or any combination of three ways, taxing, borrowing, or inflating. And if governments run into problems with taxation, too much political blowback from trying to raise taxes, or if their credit rating suffers and they can't borrow very well anymore, they will resort to the printing press. And if the interest rate on those uh, bonds rises and governments find themselves oppressed with a great deal of debt, well, self-oppressed, I guess you could say, then that is going to result in uh, even more temptation to run the printing press. Thank you very much. <laughs>